Well, terrific. Good morning, everyone. I, I was actually privileged to be part of the, uh, Larry's team, so I, uh, I drank the Kool-Aid, and I really like that, uh, that uh, make. If, please, uh, if you don't have it, uh, grab, grab one from the table, because the whole thesis uh, was really this juxtaposition of we have manufacturing, oh, that's dirty, dark, dangerous, declining, that's the old stuff. Well, we have design, oh, the norm, noble future and such, and then the, the magic eye, the innovation. And it's really what that uh, is starting is you can't have one without the other two. It's really uh, tied at the hip. So uh, building upon that, uh, really uh, uh, what I thought I would talk about is uh, sparking this new manufacturing renaissance. So I'm going to talk about the three R's. You hear an awful lot about uh, a revolution in manufacturing. I firmly believe we are at our third manufacturing revolution. You also hear this term on U.S. manufacturing renaissance. Yes, we are undergoing a, a renaissance. We are, uh, it, it's, it's nascent, it is, it is there, it needs to be much bigger, but that's why the federal government has a special focus on manufacturing. But how do we strengthen and accelerate this uh, U.S. manufacturing renaissance. And then the third R is, what's reality? So uh, I want to talk about that and bring in this whole initiative on the National Network for Manufacturing Innovation, NAMI. Uh, they self-named themselves the National Additive Manufacturing uh, Innovation Institute and Additive. Uh, I get nervous, if you can't tell from, whenever you talk to, at the National Academies, and my goodness, um, you know, look at all the PhDs in the room. So I get nervous about talking to such a such an august group because I'm just a manufacturing guy, and so I'm I'm going to employ the uh, spaghetti principle here, which is throw enough pasta slides at the wall, and maybe something's going to stick that you find value. So uh, I'm going to move through lots of slides, and uh, my sincere hope that some of this is of interest. Here's the whole storyline, but before we begin. I left industry um, and I joined the National Institute of Standards and Technology, founded in 1901 for, as the National Bureau of Standards. What's unique about this is it always has, from its foundation, this mission of working on U.S. innovation and industry. But really, I'm here uh, not representing NIST, but representing this interagency team, this Advanced Manufacturing National Program Office, uh, which is uh, called for by AMP, Advanced Manufacturing Partnership, but the interagency team is really like all of these other coordinating bodies. Uh, we are all working together on a common mission. So we're at the National Academies. I, I recalled just in 2009, the president addressed the uh, uh, National Academy of Sciences annual meeting, and I thought this was very, very relevant because this was uh, the president's thinking right before the, the whole AMP initiative, encouraging young people to create, build, and event, uh, 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 invent, to be makers of things, not just consumers of things. My goodness, that is the clarion call today, and this is what, what's behind. Uh, you've seen this. Everyone's familiar with, you know, the, the manufacturing re revolution. Well, why is it a revolution? Because of its, its socioeconomic impact. It's taking this, this juxtaposition of technologies and business, and then it, it sort of clicks, and suddenly the standard of living in the world just shot up because of uh, this advent of mass production, standardized parts, uh, the science of machine tools, and then freeing up from water power, having steam engines and then, then later electric engines. Well, the second manufacturing revolution built upon this, this whole focus of can we do better, a manufacturing system, this is personified by Henry Ford's uh, assembly line, of course, but it goes much, much uh, more beyond this whole vertical inter integration, uh, the moving assembly line, but take this whether it's vertically integrated or horizontally, it turned into a system. And the standard of living, the world impact shot up more. What, what we're talking about today, why you see all these newspaper articles, magazine articles about the third manufacturing revolution, is it's changing. It's, there's no, no question of, of this. And this well may be called the digital manufacturing, smart manufacturing, adaptive, distributed, and yes, the theme of this session, democratized. Why? Well, it's all about information flows, and this is an additive. Additive is one of these digital technologies. It's not the only one, but it's a perfect example, because those of you like, like me watching, uh, watching Star Trek as, uh, as a kid, you know, you walk in there, and what would you like? I'd like a cheeseburger, and then remember that thing? What up? Oh, and there is the cheeseburger. Well, what a cool thing. Printing, by the way, printing food is a big business these days. 
scary. But uh, I, I, I still would go to Five Guys for, for a, a hamburger, then uh, they're not of, um, a 3D printer. But it, is, it clicks for people what we're really talking about. So why, is, why do we have this focus on this manufacturing renaissance? Well, this was a big driver. Uh, I normally talk to a lot of groups, and I have to make the business case of why manufacturing matters for business, for, for employment, for trade. But the bigger reason and more relevant reason to this group is its, its uh, foundation on uh, the innovation ecosystem. So manufacturing has a huge shape. And for the first time in our history as a nation, we swung from a trade surplus in advanced technology products to a deficit, a hundred billion dollar uh, trade deficit, and the, the and the it's a complicated story, lots of dynamics, but it's not just the race to the bottom, it's not just the outflow for uh, cheap labor. Uh, this chart is all about these advanced technology uh, products. These are the these are the things that were invented here, but are being made elsewhere, and labor cost is ten percent, five percent, three percent, one percent. It's not a dr uh, driver. Yes, labor costs is a, a, a part of it. And by the way, that's part of the onshoring trend. Labor rates, arbitrage, put in productivity, put in, uh, put in shipping, put in the cost of time, put in the cost of, of moving goods. And suddenly, uh, this is what's behind the announcement. And, it's, and folks, there's many more announcements just being teed up about global companies uh, launching their plants in the United States. We're considered the high the l relatively low cost, high productivity place. Uh, so these are the things that we invented and uh, to a certain extent they were outshored or this is the more worrisome part, they were scaled up elsewhere. So this is behind the policy milestones. I hope most of you are familiar with the uh, various PCAS reports. Um, the June 2011 made the case for a national innovation policy. The February uh, 2012 uh, called for the Congress Competes Act, but that was the federal voice on a national uh, strategic plan for advanced manufacturing. The July one was the AMP, Advanced Manufacturing Partnership. So I, I, I look at last year of, of the government view and industry and academia, uh, those three views, that, that, uh, that three-legged stool, if you will, and then in January, one of the key recommendations in both the NSTC report and the, and the PCAST AMP report called for manufacturing innovation institutes, not research institutes, innovation institutes. And in January, we, we uh, published our, uh, our report. This is, this is not about chasing, how do we take that that's out, out short? How do we uh, get that back in the, this, that's not about that. It's about how do we, uh, everyone's familiar uh, with the S curve on technology. How do we accelerate the curve and pick what are the new, disruptive, amazing technologies, get expert in that, and then more to the point, develop the technology to scale it up. If you scale up, if you have the infrastructure, if you have the supply base, if you have the know-how, uh, economists, and I love economists, they take complicated uh, words and uh, complicated ideas, and then they, uh, then they uh, pick silly sounding words. But, so they just call it sticky. How do we make things really sticky here because manufacturing is global. The idea isn't just to put up walls and such, but make this the place for advanced ma manufacturing. So this is, this is a different one, this innovation risk spike, the so-called valley of death, but that we continue to lead the world from a science base, from basic research, our national labs and especially our universities. Applied research and development, that is the so-called missing middle but the commercialized products. So where does industry uh, go? Where does, uh, where does government stop? And this is the graphic from that PCAS report, the uh, famous uh, missing middle. Now this is called, if you're, not, uh, you're probably familiar with these technology readiness levels, four to seven. But when this w went out, a lot of people said, oh, well, the answer is we need a government program and we need to spend more government money on government-owned TRL four to seven. No. That wasn't it at all. It's, we have, as the economists say, a market failure. What we have isn't uh, a government spend, because by the way, the government spends a lot of money in four to seven. This is a stylized chart. But uh, nearly all of that is for defense or national security. What we have here is this so-called industrial commons of industry, uh, uh, public companies, quarter to quarter, 
uh, investing in that four to seven, a lot of those innovations uh, are so-called the industrial commons. And innovation there helps not just that company, but their competitors. Uh, so we have, uh, we have an underinvestment in this space. And that's really what this whole initiative is about. A piece of this space is something called sh uh, user facilities, especially for small and medium-sized companies, which are the outsized source. You know, I work for a big company for a quarter century, but it's, it's, and big companies do amazing things, but uh, it's, it's the small and mediums that have innovation, that have innovative ideas, but these are the least able to have PhDs on staff, great labs, know that. And so this user facility idea is really important. And it's not a new idea. We have lots of federally funded or uh, user facilities that in, in industry. Here's two examples. There's one just up the road at Scenic NIST, uh, the Center for Nanoscale Science and Technology. It is really a cutting edge, not only a laboratory, but a user facility. If you have an idea, you can come and experts will help you build it. So this is a manufacturing facility at the, at the nanoscale, but it's also doing some cutting edge research. That's an example of one user facility. Another one, I just came from Oak Ridge, uh, Thursday and Friday, we had a major event in additive. And uh, they were showing off their brand new, the ribbon cutting for, for the carbon fiber manufacturing demonstration facility was just two weeks ago. So the idea with carbon fiber is, if you take this exciting technology, there's carbon fiber and then there's nano enhance, you know. Uh, if you take, if you look at the aerospace and defense side, they have the, uh, they will take up in the entire capacity of advanced carbon fiber. The idea behind the carbon fiber MDF is, how do we uh, attack things like light weighting? Well, carbon fiber is an enabling material and technology not at its current price. So at the very least, this MDF is about scaling up, cutting in half the price of carbon fiber, and for advanced nano things, cutting it by one, perhaps two decimal points. That's the scale-up factor. Well, we were there for additive manufacturing, a brand new demonstration facility, user facility, and that's what we're going to be talking about on our next speaker, but I'll be talking about that in just a moment, but an exciting user facility for additive. So why did I start that way? Well, because demonstration facilities are a key element. But they, plus research institutes, that's not what the president called for, these innovation institutes. What the president called for last year, it was key recommendation from the PCAST report and the NSTC report, are, the, are these institutes for manufacturing excellence, these innovation institutes. So what he announced is Congress, uh, uh, he asked Congress to authorize uh, it's a one-time investment to stand up, support over a seven up to ten year period, but uh, self-sustaining manufacturing is innovation is institutes, that would be up to 15, but the president also asked us agency leaders, do what you can with the existing budgets and authorities, prove out the idea, and go ahead with the pilot. So what are we talking about? We're talking about something on the federal side but it's a partnership. It's focused on that missing middle, that four to seven. And the key thing of this slide is it's in that missing middle, the, the so-called missing Bell Labs, but it's also big enough to have impact. Uh, an institute would be the place in our nation with the best equipment, the best researchers, the best minds, and the best, hairiest problems to work on. So what we did, uh, uh, did I mention I'm the import from industry, so uh, what's, what's normal for us is a little different uh, for government, and let us engage the public. So we had uh, four input sessions, an RFI, and then we had a design review uh, afterwards, uh, and uh, this was amazing. Uh, I, I recognize some of the people in this audience were at these sessions, so if you can barely read that, good. Uh, but take it on faith that if you attended this or you if you replied to the RFI, your name's up there. And that was really, really important. It validated a lot of ideas, but it gave us a lot of new ideas. So that led up to this design report, the, this NSTC report. And I'm told afterwards it's a very unusual White House report that has seven authors, let alone 700 authors. So that's what we did. We engaged the public, and this is a, this little cartoon is really what it's about. It's about a place that is the melting pot, the, the coming together, that 
Uh, those of you that have gone up to Bell Labs, that infinite hall, and it's the place where all the functions come together and bump into, and then uh, uh, crazy ideas can, hey, especially, we do it here, what if we apply it there? Embedded in that, if you see that little green box, the shared user facility, that's an important element. But if we stop there, just a user facility or just a demonstration facility. If we, if we look at others, research, if we stop there, uh, as Secretary Blank said when she announced uh, NAMI, it's not your father's research institute. It's more. It's all about the place where large, medium, and small companies, industry, uh, so industry writ large, universities, national labs, um, national labs, uh, I'm sorry, the national labs on the government side, but universities, research universities, and especially community colleges. If you read the report, up front is that elevator speech. I won't read this to you, but the whole point is it's the place where we collaborate. It's not about doing things for the government. Government is taking its role, its most powerful uh, role in the space, which is the, which is the power of convening. And it's a place for industry and academia to come together. So a few key characteristics of this is it's chartered. Each of them is a partnership, heavy emphasis on that P word. Each would have its own unique focus area, whether it's a, a process, material, technology, or an entire new industry sector. And the idea is, is the government is an angel investor, big one-time investment, started up, and if we do it right, it's self-sustaining. This is the other piece, user facility, research, but this is the other key piece, which is workforce development and education. So this isn't competing with community colleges or MEPs, they're all part of it, it's a major mission of it. So in summary for NNMI, the idea is to be game changing. A presence at scale in that missing middle, a partnering of all the stakeholders, uh, to address this so-called uh, missing middle or industrial commons in this area. It's, it's there to encourage pre-competitive work in a collaborative way. By the way, institutes can do competitive work, secret work, but that's contract research for that, that company. Um, I talked about institutes, but the idea is to have a whole network of these. And it's at the end of the day, its overarching mission is create new US manufacturing uh, jobs. So um, let's move on. Well, I said that the president announced, here it is, guys design it. I shouldn't say guys, gals too. Um, but uh, design this. And we engage the best and brightest from industry and academia. But in the meantime, uh, you know, especially those in industry, you can study something to, uh, to death, but let's have, let's have a test bed, try it out, and you'll learn so much so quickly when you fail and fail fast. So what the topic picked was additive manufacturing. And uh, this was in, done in, in what I'm told is record time from the announcement of the notice to the actual award. What's unique about this is that 10 different areas and five different agencies came together as one. It was DOD led, but it was a multi-agency approach and it's all about additive. Now that little hand printed at Oak Ridge in titanium, that's a moving printed hand, but that's a, that's a moving hydraulically actuated uh, uh, hand. And what's, what's interesting about that is lightweight, very strong, but those hydraulic lines are, are, were printed, were part of, the, part of the material. So why additive? Because it could be overused, but it is part of that manufacturing revolution. 20% uh, of 3D printers are now finding final products. 3D printing has been around for 15 years, but it's been a niche, it's been a prototyping tool. Now it's gone mainstream and it's gone mainstream two different ways. One is to the consumer, user, hobbyist. The other is to advanced materials, uh, plastics, uh, ceramics, uh, metals, to the point where it's surprisingly cost effective to do production runs in the thousands and compete against uh, existing products. So uh, this was announced, it's called NAMI, they named themselves, and the initial, the initial tranche of money that the, uh, that the government put up, uh, 30 million, uh, was matched by 40 million from, from, from the private sector. So current members, this is, this is a dangerous slide because every week I check and there's a few more uh, added. Uh, you go on their website, it's now 75, 75 uh, partners in NAMI. Uh, what we announced on Friday 
was uh, NAMI is now the Oak Ridge National Lab, that new brand new additive manufacturing, uh, manufacturing demonstration facility is now a core member of NAMI. And if you're a partner of NAMI, you have 400 hours on that machine over there. It doesn't matter if that machine is in Youngstown, Ohio, or Oak Ridge, Tennessee. It's all transparent, no paperwork uh, done, and it's an ex idea of the extended enterprise. And my screen just went blank. Oh, it's back, hi. <laughs> uh, so where's NAMI going? The whole point of NAMI is not to have, like every institute, it's not to be the win for Ohio. Actually, it's not even Ohio. The, the state of Pennsylvania put in twice as much money as the state of Ohio. It's all about citing something to work on the right thing, but if uh, the, the key measure of impact for an institute is that it has a regional impact Re leading to a national impact. So next year, this is the footprint of NAMI, and that's the exciting thing. I think the remarkable thing about NAMI is we're expecting it to have bumps, and they continue to e exceed expectations. So let's build upon NAMI. Why I wanted to talk about the democratization of this digital technology. Well, what's happening? Well, I mentioned uh, Thursday, Friday, we were down at Oak Ridge for an event. It's all about uh, additive. and. Uh, Tom Kerfis threw up, well, I have a half-brained half idea, but this is my observation of, look at what's happening. Uh, back in the day, and I, I probably like you, I still have turntable and some vinyl. You know, I don't want to get rid of that. And so it, it, it was the analog days, right? And then we went digital. Uh, and that, wow, well, yeah, go, the golden years, we can always, well, guess what? The digital got good enough. But then it got really interesting with uh, data compression technologies as well as uh, networking technologies. So suddenly it was revolutionary. Everyone has an, uh, has an MP3 player. Oh, now who, who developed that? One of those manufacturing institutes in another country, by the way. Uh, so MP3 uh, player, and then finally it went distributed. And after they sorted out a few things like Napster, okay, it's off and running and a whole new a disruptive technology. Uh, if you don't believe it's uh, disruptive technology, go to your local record store uh, and, uh, or go to a Best Buy and find out it used to be half the store was media and now it's this thing. So very, very disruptive. Well, take that same idea. 2D from photographs. Um, when's the last time you bought film and then took it down and hoped that uh, 10 of your 25 pictures turned out? Well, it's because you know, it's that, well, the analogy I, I would submit is valid on 3D because the same thing is happening. And it's only, it's huge in terms of data, but not only are technologies about the, taking the analog, converting it from a scan uh, to new advanced uh, design uh, materials uh, from uh, triangular mesh to, uh, to advanced models, but the new emerging disruption here is uh, representation compression and then moving it to cloud computing and those little things that uh, I have sons that are, think Xbox is the coolest thing around but uh, look at those graphics accelerators those little things are amazing technology and that's what's going to advance additive I'm going to borrow some slides uh, from our friends of Virginia Tech they spoke on Friday about education to make the point here lots of people are working in this area and lots of people are working throughout the entire co continuum from K, K through 12 through this proverbial K through gray. So uh, the K through 12, the undergraduate, the graduate, and the continuing ed. So here's a few images here of just what Virginia Tech and many, many other um, universities and uh, so, uh, societies are working in the space. But of course, this is what we hear about. It's the, uh, impacting on the under, undergraduate and graduate level. And it's remarkable. I love how, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, our, our um, President Vest mentioned uh, the, design in, uh, the design contest and everyone was doing an, uh, a web page, right? Uh, well, if, if, what you, if what you're used to is that hammer, everything looks like a nail. That's why additive isn't the proxy for advanced manufacturing, but it's the on-ramp for people. I mean, when I, when I grew up, you worked on your car. You designed and built things. And my dad had a machine shop. You know, it was nothing. I, I still remember uh, we, were, we were sharing, what was your first aha moment that you're a little different? I remember it's a big deal for show and tell. Do you remember that? 
But what, a, lot, a whole lot of life lessons are, you learn in kindergarten. And I was so excited, I still remember today bringing in my set, because it was an old dinged up set, but my show and tell, very first in my life, was my set of Johansson gauge blocks. Because I would show the kids, put this together, evacuate the air, look, metal is, is floating. Uh, well, unfortunately, not enough uh, people have access to manufacturing tools and design tools. And that's what the third and last slide from Virginia Tech. This is an idea that they have. It's in their hall. This is the additive dream vendor. Dream is their acronym for the program. But any student, you can design, you can uh, take it, you put it on an SD card, you, you put it in, it's free, it's part of your student, uh, student fee, and you can print and out thunk. It's, it's, it's the antithesis of a, of a vending machine where you have to choose one of these and oh, the granola bar is out, I have to get a snicker bar or something. It's, one, it's the opposite of that because I can print anything and it thunk, it print, uh, my design prints out at the bottom. Uh, why are we talking about this big change? Because a lot of the patents, original patents in additive, are now expiring. And that has revolutionized. That's why this personal one, this is a slide I'm, I'm borrowing from Friday from 3D Systems. They're wrong. You can go all, on the internet, you can get all the parts you need and build your own 3D printer for under $500 now. Okay, so this is, the, this is, this is how it's diverting. Higher and higher end with higher productivity, lower and lower end that is now cost effective. So why, uh, besides the equipment, the other piece is that authoring systems are exploding. Suddenly, you, uh, non-technical people can take an idea and make it. I can't think of a more exciting uh, transformation to democratize <coughs> manufacturing than if you can think it, I can make it. And this is why I'm so fired up about the future of manufacturing and the future of manufacturing in the United States. One last piece. A whole lot of people think additive is how do I, how do I take something existing and make it in a different way? Well, you can do that. And if it's low volume, okay, it makes sense. That's not the promise. It's all about revolution. This was, this was printed last week. It's a bearing. Would you make a bearing this way? The, the folks at Timken will tell you, no. Why am I showing this to you? This was printed one shot on an additive machine. No assembly required. Now, to those engineers in the room, OK, the, the, to everyone else, this is stupid, right? Then you, then you start thinking, no. This is part of the material. There's no bearing race. It's part of the material. This is part of the material. This is how we get a translation. We can print. Uh, no assembly required. We can print something like a bearing, and it just shows you how do you take this and do it in a different way. Well, design tools, instead of replicating it, suddenly you can take it and uh, have the same effect, but design it a different way, and take out 70% of the weight. So a whole lot of light weighting or strengthening is happening, and it's because of these conformal lattice structure tools. Then people say, oh, well, yeah, yeah, you'll never that won't have an effect. You know, it's great for mass customization, but who wants to print one? Uh, for those of us uh, that keep on getting solicitations from AARP and then over, look at, the, I don't care if the company's making a million of them. If I need a knee replacement, I want the perfect one for me. And I want it scanned and I want it print and I want it low cost and I want it high quality. And of course I want them. So this is where a technology like additive, these are these are the opportunities for additive. And a whole lot of people are, nope, it's low volume. The Invisalign, look at the number here, 60,000 Invisaligns per day. It's additive. So it's custom ortho, uh, orthopedics, uh, dental. Uh, but those hearing aids, my goodness, I, I want a perfect one for me. Here's how it's transforming on knee replacements. This is, um, I, I won't bore you with the details, but um, not only is the knee material, but this is the, this is the, uh, the tougher challenge, which is you know, making the fixtures to align the drills and that sort of thing. So uh, additive is used for not only the material, but also the in process. And the exciting thing there is they can do a scan, they can do all of their test runs, understand what's going to happen before they open up your knee. That's a good thing. Last one. Uh, okay, orthopedic braces. Folks uh, struggling with uh, carpal tunnel 
Okay, now why would I want to wear something big, clunky, and it's whatever? I want something optimal for me. And so this is a great one where scan it, design it, manufacture it, and it's perfect. And not only that, but it looks like a fashion statement. So this is, that's, that's the promise of mass customization on these things. So where am I leading up to? This technology is one of the flavors of digital manufacturing. And I believe that it has the opportunity for the democratization of manufacturing. If you haven't gone to a maker movement event, please do. And you'll get fired up on, oh my goodness, everyone is, is, wants to make things and they're running around to, to use different devices. It's bottom up, sharing 3D open source philosophy. And I submit that this effect is akin to the PC revolution of the 80s. I'll leave you on this one with, uh, this is Scott Summit from Bespoke Innovations, that he wanted to create a leg that had a level of humanity. Not only was optimal right size for, for that person, not only was it optimal in function, but it looked good. And that's really the, uh, uh, the, the tagline I want to uh, have here is that things like digital manufacturing or additive create the ability for everyone to be a nation of bespoke makers. So where do we go? Well, uh, I mentioned that it started with, uh, with the President's announcement. If you've seen the, the State of the Union address uh, today, he uh, started on the initiatives. The first one he highlighted was on making America a magnet for new jobs and manufacturing. He actually cited the NAMI Institute. Uh, great uh, progress. NAMI is, is, is off and running, and they have their, their first portfolio of research projects uh, undergoing. So what he asked us is, again asked for Congress to authorize but uh, again using existing budgets and authorities. We are gonna take what we learned from NAMI. We're gonna take what we learned from you, from the workshops and the RFI, uh, and as published in that design document in, in January, and now let's move ahead with three full-size manufacturing institutes. Uh, and so what we'll, be, we'll, what we'll be doing, the solicitations will be coming out very, very, very shortly, okay? Um, and, and the awards are this year for these institutes. So it's a great idea, it's a validated idea, and let's get going with this. We will continue to work. We have been hard at work on the NNMI design, the design of the network and the thorny issues, or I, I call them the great opportunities, things like IP, things like a performance metrics. So we've been hard at work on the other details. And then we have lots of other uh, initiatives being announced every single week. DOE's Clean Energy Manufacturing Initiative was announced a week and a half ago, and we're gonna have a solicitation called AMTEC, Advanced Manufacturing Technology Consortia, to stand up more things like, um, like uh, Semitech and uh, the Manual Electronics Research Institute. So our focus here will be underwriting, the first year underwriting technology, uh, technology roadmaps and planning, and then we'll segue into that supporting of, of, uh, of, of consortias not competing with, but complementing. Institutes would be the big thing up here. This would be smaller on the portfolio scale, but we think it's a good idea, and uh, we're hard at work on this. So thank you for watching my 432 slides, and um, think different. All right. Well, I'm, I'm no expert on the federal budget. It's a, it's a strange time. Uh, uh, Congress actually uh, had a continuing resolution for some agencies, uh, uh, gave other agencies a full budget. Amtec was approved and was a, NIST had an actual an, an increase in FY14. I'm sorry, FY13. So sequestration uh, is it's, uh, it's hitting very uh, unevenly. Uh, some major programs uh, have to be scaled back, but uh, as the president indicated, uh, advanced manufacturing is, uh, is a key priority, and uh, Congress did give various agencies the uh, of authority for flexibility. And for that reason, uh, that's why DOE, DOD, 
uh, Commerce, NIST uh, are actually announcing more activities and more programs in this, uh, in this space. So it's, it's a tense matter, and uh, our friends up on the Hill have a lot of hard issues to work out, but uh, in the meantime, uh, we have uh, a lot to keep us busy. Uh, well, heavens, those professionals, they're, they're just they're just old, uh, obsolete. Now, uh, <laughs> uh, actually, that's Mark, uh, been uh, president of, uh, of AS, ASME, and I've been an active member of ASME for 33 years, uh, among other organizations. Professional societies are incredibly important. They are important uh, not only because of their engagement with, uh, with government, with, with industry, with academia, uh, but also with standards uh, and uh, uh, communication and seminars and uh, technical conference conferences. But I have to uh, uh, scoot out uh, from the dinner he uh, here and go up to a dinner up on the hill because ASME is celebrating their 40th anniversary of Federal Fellows. And so I'm going to be uh, parochial and say uh, one of the most important things that uh, hit me was serving as a Federal Fellow sponsored by a professional society. And uh, I, uh, my office counts on federal fellows from industry and academia to help us with, with design. So uh, every bit um, important, actually, uh, they always were important, but I'd say they're even more important in conferences, convening ideas, helping with the neutral, balanced voice, and supporting uh, programs like the Federal Fellows Program uh, going through AAAS big, big uh, supporter because I've seen the impact. I, I have three federal fellows on the interagency team uh, right now, and uh, I can do IPAs with uh, universities. I can't bring on, you know, the best and brightest from industry. It, I can't bring them on directly for a uh, six month or a year, except through programs like uh, AAAS or ASME's Federal Fellows Program. Next question. Uh, Phil Westmoreland, AICHE. Our moderator was speaking about how services are part of the manufacturing enterprise also. Yes. Uh, the public, you're right, still sees it as durable goods and assembly lines. Mad additive manufacturing is changing that. But of course, medications have to be manufactured. Fuels have to be manufactured. The materials that go into additive manufacturing have to be manufactured. Can you talk about making sure the, how, how we get to the public as far as addressing that broader view of manufacturing that is very cross-disciplinary? Uh, great, great question. And actually, I'm a manufacturing guy. I started, I've always wanted to be one because I want to take an idea and make it. And that, that, that was it for me. Um, uh, I've never understood this dichotomy between, oh, there's manufacturing and then there's services. And services are financial and IT and I want to work in computers. Well, visit any manufacturing plant in the country, and that machine tool has 20 times more compute power than the space shuttle. You know, so uh, we've had an image problem, and uh, I think we have we had a, uh, a communication problem where uh, Larry is uh, uh, first among uh, many articulate speakers on. It's not the service economy. It's 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 not manufacturing or service. It's manufacturing and service. So look at. Look at almost any great service area. There's a manufacturing sector behind it some, somehow. So uh, part of this is uh, the AMP report actually called for, we need a public service announcement or something like that. Uh, great, we might, but you know what? I think I point to the maker movement. Nothing will change things more than uh, uh, contests like FIRST Robotics, uh, the maker movement in uh, educating people about manufacturing, uh, and especially about learning about processes. So that's, well, that's why, again, I'm fired up. But I'd say that uh, the way to tear down that wall is to show people that it's not manufacturing or service. If you want to be high-tech service, if you want to be high-tech uh, computers, manufacturing is kind of the driver behind all of that. I'll just add to that quickly. In the auto industry, um, you need to keep 10 years, be able to provide service parts for your car 10 years after you take it out of production. So you have all the tooling and everything, and so you're always figuring out 
how many should I build and put an inventory over a 10-year period? Imagine now, taking what Mike talked about and what your inventorying isn't the, the part, it's the math and the ability yeah. to tailor make a part as you need it. It's just going to be phenomenal how this will change. Other questions? Well, l l let me add to his ad here. Why the DOD? Why are they so fired up about it? Ever get on an aircraft carrier? Look at all the stuff that they carry because that might break. Oh, my goodness. Um, and then uh, uh, this whole supply chain. What if you could just, you have the data and you can print it on demand? So uh, this is why uh, companies like GM, it will revolutionize, it will disrupt the supply chain and it will revolutionize this. Um, uh, Kink Kinko's and FedEx, they're, they're, uh, uh, Kinko's I believe, announced that they will have metal-based printers at their, so the same thing of printing a photograph, now you can uh, print that, oh, my shower hanger, whatever broke, I don't go to the company, I go to their website, I, it's free or I pay them some money and I send that uh, model and I go to my Kinko's to print it up. Now, I think that the folks at GM are looking at that and realizing that's disruptive. How can we make a buck on this? I bet that if I need a part for, for my old uh, GM vehicle in the future, I can get one printed locally, and GM will charge me for that, for that convenience. I, a lot. A lot. <laughs> uh, two more questions for Mike. Mike, I think if I heard you correctly, you said the government was going to make a one-time investment in these institutes. You know, you're going to facilitate, I assume we'll facilitate it, and, and within 12 months to maybe 18 months, most of those facilities are going to be obsolete. What's the plan for renewing those things as time goes on to keep the institutes modern? Oh, a, a great question. So uh, let, me, let me separate it into the two parts. The NNMI, the billion dollar of mandatory funding uh, that is uh, teed up, it's to establish the centers, the, uh, uh, that doesn't mean that an institute cannot attract federal dollars in the future, but that would buy, be by competitive grants and such. Uh, what we wanted to, to avoid is the permanent mortgage issue of doesn't matter if it's working or not, here, here you have this, this, uh, this ongoing mandate. So it's very, very clear that the NNMI investment is one time, but it does not mean that an institute can't, uh, can't uh, earn more federal support. The second part of, of your question is, how do you make sure that they're relevant? Well, a big part of that is it's competitive, and NNMI, it's not what the government chooses, it's from uh, what industry and academia choose. And industry will not choose something that is the flash in the pan be, uh, to co-invest. So these are the areas, it was pointed out, uh, actually in the last talk I gave, someone will say, well, you have a pilot, we're gonna do three more, and then NNMI is at adding up to 15 more from that. Call it 20 institutes. Well, you'll run out of problems, right? Well, in the RFI we collected, what would you like an institute to be in? It was pointed out that Fraunhofer's have, depending upon how you count them, 64 Fraunhofer's. Uh, so the, the, the uh, short answer there is, if it's chartered in the right area and it's industry driven, it will remain relevant because if it doesn't, it will have to change its portfolio or sunset itself. Okay, I think we'll wrap up there for Mike then. Thank you very much. Thank you.